Um, okay, so <clears throat> I guess it'd be nice to just kind of introduce ourselves first before we, before we start in. Um, so um, my name's Phil Hesketh and I'm the founder of a startup called ConsentKit. So we uh, build, uh, it's like a browser-based like web software for organizations and institutions to uh, to manage like informed consent and uh, informed consent processes and kind of some of the data that goes around that. Um, and I'll be host hosting the workshop today. Who wants to go next? <laughs> what should we just jump in? Um, so I'm Shweb Sufi, I'm community leader at Software Sustainability Institute. And yeah, that's me. Hi everyone, I'm Malvika Sharan. I'm also community manager uh, in Turing Way. And I'm very excited about this workshop. Hi, uh, I'm Lawrence Brown. Uh, I'm a research technology specialist at the University of Oxford. Um, well, for about a year previous to that, I was a, a neuroscience and circadian biologist for about 18 years. So shifting from one space to another. Yeah, cool. Um, hi, I'm Gary. Um, so, uh, yeah, I'm at the University of Manchester, former Software Sustainability Institute fellow. Oh, well, I guess I'm still out, but yeah. Yeah. And uh, I'm Jonathan Frawley. I'm an RSE in Durham University. Oh, cool. Great. So lots of uh, different universities. Well. That's awesome. Um, okay. So let me see if I can... Did everyone get into Miro? Okay. Was any... Was that... Was everyone kind of in? Yep. Perfect. Okay, so I'll just share my screen with you so you should be able to see what I am looking at at the moment. Um, so let's go up here. Cause I so um, we're going to do this research data discovery workshop today. Um, so this is really designed to help us understand uh, what data we produce in our research and like how we manage and take care of that. It's really important to understand this and um, so we've got like as, as researchers we have a duty of care to let people know like why we need their information and and who we need it for and um, this may be more of a thing in um in business and in enterprise than in academia and um, a lot of the time research happens really quickly and we kind of rush through stuff uh, so things like informed consent is a really good way to uh, let the person know what it is that they're getting involved in but also like how are you going to treat their data and it kind of helps you build trust and, and potentially get better uh, better insights from um, so it also, uh, by thinking about like data and like how that data moves through our process, it helps us to prevent that information getting into the wrong hands. So There's things that kind of touch on this, like security and stuff like that. And also thinking about uh, the potential for our participants to be identified and like how we anonymize that data. So doing this like not only helps us be uh, be compliant with things like GDPR, um, but it also helps sort of respect people's privacy and uh, and the right to be forgotten. Um, so. With uh, what we're going to do today is basically map out uh, our, a single process uh, that we might do, so something like an interview or, or a workshop, for example, and understand like where any risks might be, and think about how we might improve our process and how how we handle that data, and then potentially to write better uh, informed consent forms. So it works a bit like this. So. Um, Essentially, it's, if it, one way I kind of explain this is it's a bit like plumbing. Like if you imagine like the top part of this line is uh, like the pipes and this is kind of the system of like th things that we use like a device or a mobile phone to capture information. So in the case of an interview, um, I, might turn, I might turn up to someone's house or something like this to talk to them or maybe I'll do that online uh, and I might use my mobile phone to record that and then I might transfer the data from a mobile phone to a Google Drive uh, through using my Wi-Fi at home or maybe the Wi-Fi in the office. And then I might download that onto a laptop. And then from that laptop, I might use something like Photoshop or uh, Adobe Audition to like edit that sound and kind of process that. Uh, and then I might transfer that um, either back to the shared drive or it might go into uh, a Google slide deck or something like that, or a PowerPoint maybe. And then I might present that to other people so other people might access it and see it at that point. So this is kind of like the, the pipes through which the data moves, if you like. And then under, underneath, there's kind of the different put, different types of data that we're collecting, and at which point, um, you know, is that person is their person identifiable data there, and also are there, um, you know, is that been de-identified or is that anonymous? 
So we're going to kind of talk a little bit about what that means as well, uh, and just kind of go over a few uh, a few different ways of doing that. Does that kind of make sense? Any questions so far? Cool. So uh, we've all got into Miro. Um, so also, we just to say again, we're going to re we're recording the session. So if anyone needs to kind of like break out at any point for whatever reason, feel free to, and we'll share the recordings with you afterwards. Uh, and we're going to go through this quite quickly today. Normally, this takes about ninety minutes to do as a as a workshop. Um, because it's good to have time to kind of go through the process, but then to kind of really reflect and talk about talk about the process as well. But we're a little short on time today. So if you wanted to do this again, I've, I've open sourced the workshop um, and the URL is in the mirror board as well, but you can access it here uh, and it's in like a printable format. So it basically you can export it as a download it as a PDF and then you can just, um, run that, print that off at home and then cut up the cards and you're ready to go and run it uh, as you want. So uh, let's get started. So if we jump over to uh, the Miro board. And you can see we're all in here, brilliant. So what we'll do is, um, <clears throat> what I was thinking is if each one of us could, uh, you could, so uh, in fact, I'll give you a bit of an introduction to Miro at first. So it's, it's kind of straightforward, like you can zoom, if you've got a mouse wheel, you can use that to zoom in and out. Um, if you want to select things, you can just kind of drag a box and select stuff, or you can click on things individually. Um, and then what, if you zoom in onto, say, the cards, so what I've done is I've, ba I've basically pre-filled the cards to try and make them to be like an editable, um, an editable form. So if you press uh, Shift and Control, I think it's Shift Control G to ungroup them, and then and maybe and then Control G or Command G if you're on a Mac to, to group them again. You'll, uh, you'll then be able to like click in and edit each of the individual things. So what we'll do is before we start to like um, ungroup and group stuff, oh, one more thing, sorry, which is important is if you, if we drag over the whole thing like this and then press uh, control C and then just find like a blank space on the map and press control V, you'll create a copy of everything. And that'll be like your working copy to, to take from. And then as we go through the map, you can take each one of the cards individually, just create a new copy of it, paste it in, and then we can start to like build out that, uh, that process, as you've seen. So we might have a bit of overlap with uh, other people's maps. So maybe if, we, maybe if we just go straight down rather than across, because if the maps get quite long, then um, we'll still have, uh, still have a bit of space. If you have any questions as well, just, uh, just shout out. So are we making a copy for ourselves somewhere? Is that what we're doing now? Yeah, just grab, grab everything from, from here and make a copy. And then just, if you take it straight down to a, find a little bit of space straight down, it doesn't, it goes across the map rather than up and down. So if we kind of make our own like swim lanes, if you like. Okay, thanks. So can can these so at the moment you've put them as some sort of a workflow, is that right? No, no. This is just like a, it's, um, it's like a little repository, really. So you'll be able to just they're, they're just each one of these are the individual cards that we need. So um, can but, these uh, can you can you export this setting somehow, or it doesn't matter where each file is at the moment? Is this it, it a, is this where each card okay? Is. Yeah, you're just kind of creating copies for yourself that you can like pull down. So, um, oh, well, we've all gone a bit. A bit <laughs> Let's tidy this up. Okay. We're all set up, uh, thereabouts. Okay, so if um everyone is kind of set up well if you come back up to the top uh, just to where we started and i'll just kind of like show you quickly how uh, how it works and then um we can like uh we can we can crack on does anyone not have the board set up before 
one, two. Uh, I don't have it set up yet, sorry. That's okay. Can we, do you want me to duplicate some of these out for people? Yeah, that makes it easier. So do this and then. If you did, um, Are you able to get in? Okay, Jonathan, I've just seen an email from you requesting access. Yeah, yeah, I have access now, thanks. Okay, great. Okay, people seem to kind of settled, which is good. I, sorry, I'm still having trouble just working out how to copy and paste stuff. <laughs> okay, which, um, whereabouts is your board? Uh... Uh, I don't have one set up yet. Oh, okay, I'll tell you what, I'll grab this one for you. Yeah, cool, thanks. And then, can you see my cursor? Uh, yeah. Yeah, if you just follow me down, we'll come right down and set you up here. Is that okay? Perfect, thanks. No problem. So, um, okay, so if you come up to back up to the top again, uh, where I am. So what we'll do is so basically it kind of works like this. So the first thing we're going to do is just try and set up the, the pipes um, and start thinking about how information you move is going to go through your process. So I guess the first step is to pick um, like a, a research method that you might do to, uh, to, to, to work through. So I'm going to do an interview. So for me, this is like a qualitative uh, interview. I might go and speak to someone and talk to them uh, and do that. So that's the kind of, uh, that's going to be my my starting point, and I've just written my name on the post-it note so that people can see it's kind of my my board. Um, so if we grab, uh, so the, the first thing that I, the the first place that I start with 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 this would be like a device or the thing that I kind of capture the data on in the first place. Um, so I'm going to I'm going to click on the device card up here, and then just press Control C or Command C if you're on a Mac. And then, come out and then control V, and that will give me a copy, and I can just drag that copy down and put that at the start. Then the next, um, what I'll do is I'll just kind of run through it quickly, and then we'll go through and like change it, change it afterwards. So the next thing is like, so I've got that onto my device. If we zoom in on this card, um, let's see. So if I double click into this, oh, what's going on? So I might need to ungroup that first. And then just get rid of that. So I don't use an iPhone, but I've got an Android phone. So I might type into there and just so to type onto things, if you look at the text that's kind of like a marker. Um, and just click, just double click on it. So my phone is uh, it has a password and it's in, it's not encrypted. So I can grab that, that little cross and just click uh, and just delete it. And it'll, but it also has a fingerprint as well. So I can remove it's not secured because it, it is. So basically the device is secured using a password and it's facing finger. And then also the device, does it automatically back data up to the cloud? Uh, yes, it does. We'll get rid of those. 
And then do I keep a record of the date that the data was captured? Uh, yes, I do. And the data is deleted from this device after transferring to storage. And I'm going to say no. So this isn't about being it like is like this isn't like the perfect way to do it or this is the best this is the best or the right thing to do it's just a case of capturing like being honest with yourself and saying like what are we actually doing at each point um, and then we'll sort of talk about that later on in terms of like what's what's right or not so that kind of sets up my device um, and that's uh, yeah so that's that's there like that so the next thing I do is I will take that once I've got the recording on the device I'll take that and I'll transfer it to a um, uh, like a, my Google Drive. So looking up, up at the cards at the top again, we have a main storage card. So I'll take that and bring that down. Just copy and paste again. So just control C, control V. Um, and then you think somehow that's got to get from the device card to the storage card. So I'll need a transfer card for that. So I'll copy and paste again and then bring that down. So maybe move these around a little bit. For some reason, all the text has gone off that. Get them in groups. Oops. Oh, I see. <laughs> so sorry, my boards have gone a bit. Over there. Let me figure this out. There we go. Pretty good. Oh, no, doesn't. So while you're troubleshooting that, can I also ask out of curiosity? So you have these different cards for data and sharing card and data processor card. And we, we are manually writing it, but is it in some ways getting recorded as uh, that could be exported? Um, it's not on this, so you'll be able to, um, I'll probably be able to create versions of it for you and send it as a PDF afterwards, uh, if, you, if you'd like that. Uh, or alternatively, like, so the other thing we could do is I could just go through and show you like how this works. And then if you wanted to download the cards later on, you can like be able to do it in your own time. I wasn't sure what people wanted to get out of the session itself. How are people feeling about that? Put your hands up if you want to go ahead and keep keep doing this, or if you'd prefer to, um, would you prefer to just kind of me walk you through it and then maybe do it later on? Um, well, I think time-wise it's fine to, to carry on showing us. It allows us to understand what you're doing. Um, you know, but then if you want to switch into other stuff, 10, 15 minutes, that's fine. Sure. Okay. So, um, yeah, so we've, so we've got the device card is in and then I've got my storage card is in. Um, so with the storage one, it's a case of kind of going through the card again and seeing like, well, who else has access to this? So for me, in my context, this is would be the rest of my product team and then maybe any stakeholders that might be involved in, in my research. Um, the, and it's the case of like ungrouping, so one group is like shift, control, and uh, G uh, is a shortcut for that. I think you can right, might be able to right click on it as well. Um, nope, you can't. And then just select, so if you, if you store it in a different place, just rename that. So it has a password, it has 2FA, and it's got single sign-on. Um, so I don't think it's encrypted. And I link a copy of my consent to any research data that I collect. That's something that I do. And then, so it gets from my device to the main storage via a transfer card. So I don't upload stuff in a coffee shop. I'll upload it on my um, office Wi-Fi. Um, it's transferred by Wi-Fi. And uh, you need a, pack, a password. So this is essentially saying like, is this, is it a public um, connection essentially, or is it just private to yourself? Uh, so no one else has access to the Wi-Fi 
uh, outside of my organization. Um, and then from the main storage card, uh, I might actually use, oh, sorry, I've missed a bit. So just move these along a little bit. So for each, as I'm going through my, uh, on the device card, there might be different things that I use um, to record or like process that data on, the, on there. So I use an app, which is like a Dixaphone app called uh, Voice Recorder. Let me grab that. Again. Um, so I can just keep double clicking on the text things if you can't manage to ungroup it and you can get in. Um, so, and that process is um, video, so only audio, so I can take images and text off. Um, audio. It does have it, so actually, no, it doesn't have its own cloud storage. Um, and then the research data is deleted from it when it's completed. Let's say yes. Uh, but the license isn't owned, isn't paid for by the organization. Um, so that may or may not be as relevant in academic contexts, but it's more about um, is, if someone reviewed the privacy policy or has that been like kind of agreed by, by the organization that that's an app that's okay to use. Um, so, so now I've got my audio and it's from there and I've uploaded it to Google Drive. Um, and then from Google Drive, I might do another transfer again on the office Wi-Fi so I can just copy that and move that across and then I'm going to uh, bring that onto another device which would be my laptop so my laptop is encrypted and it has a password to get in and it is face and finger uh, it's got the touch finger thing on it. Um, so this device also does um, backup data to the cloud, but only on some apps. So I'm going to say no in and of itself and uh, do record a date. It's captured and I do not delete data when it's stored. Okay. Uh, so then Processing for here. So what I might use is um, go back up and grab another software card. So I might use a couple of different things here. So one could be um, if I've got audio, I might use, I use a program called um, Adobe Audition, and that processes audio data. And I'm going to edit clips. Um, I might remove identifiers with that as well. Uh, and then it does have its own cloud storage. And I do delete data from it when processing is complete. And that has been approved by my organization. So. I also use a thing called Google Slides, which is basically like PowerPoint. Um, so I'll take those audio clips then and put them into Google Slides. And that has actually all of those in. And I'm going to um, use this to share And this basically is in the cloud, so it does have its own cloud storage. Um, the research data isn't deleted from there when it's complete because it's Google essentially and you can't really like hard delete anything. Um, the license for that is approved by the organization. Does uh, Google Slides not count as a transfer 
from your current machine. Yep, you could put it as that. Um, if you wanted to, it's a good call. So you could do it like that, because essentially then you've got the laptop, you've gone into Audition to edit the thing down, and then you've put snippets up into, um, into Google Slides. Um, and then from there, I might share that again with, uh, so we use a sharing card is the last one. So drag that down. And then the sharing card is, uh, so it's basically like for a show and sell. So it's the audience is like stakeholders, product team. So is anyone new giving access or control of the data? And yes, they are. Um, so as soon as I share that with other people, I can't really control what it is that they do with it. So essentially they could, they could create copies or do whatever. I kind of lose control of the data at that point. So it's only going to be shared internally. It's not made public. But, um, uh, and the new file or document is created at that point because I've created a, uh, uh, a slide deck for that. So it's Google Slide Deck. Um, so it, it, I usually like will embed the audio into it rather than link it. So that's, a, that's kind of at the point that I lose control. Like one way you could link that data into it so that it wasn't, so you could stream it from a central place. And then if, even if someone else shared that, you could still take away the access to that if, if you wanted to, or if you needed to. Um, let's make that a little bit longer. Okay, is that, is that kind of making sense for people? Yeah, so like in reality, like this map could be more complicated. Like you might have multiple things on there and you might have like multiple different transfer points. Um, and sometimes they might like loop, loop background and things like that. Uh, but just a case of trying to figure that out as you kind of, kind of going through it. And um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about, um, uh, about, let's just put that to this. So like about the actual data. So the next point is kind of adding that, um, you know, if that was the pipes, it's kind of the data is like the water that flows through that. Um, that process uh, and that kind of changes uh, and adapts over over time. So I want to talk a little bit about that and really define a few terms that kind of come up. One is uh, personally identifiable information, what that means, uh, de-identification, and what that means, and anonymization. So, um, can I ask a question? Yeah, sure. So what you were just doing was, it might have been obvious to others, but you might you missed doing what you were just doing was setting up the pipes. Mm -hmm. Um, so setting up the plumbing as it were of your as your data flow um, that's why you're doing all the crosses and things like that and saying which things were applicable yeah, yeah that's right. All right cool yeah so what we'll do next is add the data in underneath and just kind of show how that changes uh, over time and to give us a, a sort of like fuller uh, picture of that okay um, aced. well just before we do that I kind of wanted to introduce some different uh, different concepts around like different types of um, or different categories of data, if you like, which are kind of important when you're uh, thinking about things in terms of like um, GDPR and stuff like that. So, um, personally identifiable information, it, it only really applies to living, living individuals and it's people that can be identified either from the data or from the data and other information which is in the possession of or likely to come into possession of the, the, the data controller or the person who is like responsible for this, uh, this data. Um, so this includes any expression of opinion about the individual and any uh, indication or intentions of the data controller that any other person respects. So it's quite, this is actually like quite a broad thing. So it kind of helps to give probably some examples. Uh, so it, the obvious ones are things like first and last names or like, you know, like ID numbers, like a driving license number or a passport number or something like that. But also um, personal addresses, telephone numbers, any images uh, of someone, uh, you know, like a picture of their face or, um, Biometric data like fingerprints, uh, retinas, voice signature. So you have, if you have someone's voice and even if they never say their name, you can still identify people from that. Um, and yeah, like also other things like asset information, like uh, IP addresses or MAC addresses, uh, can uh, can tie back to uh, a particular person. We also have like indirect identifiers. So things like a date of birth, like many people could have been born on that day, but if you combine like date of birth with place of birth and maybe religion, you might be able to narrow that down to a much smaller group of people and actually be able to identify that. So going back to kind of this other point, it's, 
it's not just a case of the data that you have it's like other data that that person may be able to come in possession of so i might be able to combine two or three different data sets together um, which give me like one or two of these to have enough of these to actually be able to narrow that down to uh, to like a specific person uh, so even something that's um seems fairly like innocuous can actually be uh, be, be used as an identifier um so the second term we talked about was um the identification so it's kind of removing the um mask uh, removing or masking the direct identifiers so back into this first uh, point of call it's anything from like this column so you know when you see documents are redacted and stuff like that this is kind of pulling pulling those things out so it might be blowing someone's face or removing an address or changing a name or something like that and it's sometimes called uh, pseudo pseudo anonymization but I can understand why people went with direct uh, with the identification because it's a lot easier to say. Um, so there's a really great uh, research resource here, which I can share a link to in the chat, um, which is the anonymization decision making framework. It's quite meaty, but it's a really like solid um, process for kind of going through this stuff. Um, and I will yeah I'll put that into Zoom um, in a second just while you're doing that there's a new version of that coming out mark's mark's just finished um it's oh, really? and, and it is creative commons as well so it's available to everybody to just download oh fantastic do you know when that's coming out uh i i have um a, a i think what well, there's a think in the final version so hopefully quite soon yeah brilliant i'll, I'll look forward to that um yeah, so that's that's really great, and it's got there's a thing in there as well called the um, the motivated intruder test, which is like really useful as a way to kind of because it's really difficult to say well how you know if you, and if you're getting into this uh, like anonymization for example, it's basically like ensuring that the risk of someone being identified by that data is negligible. Uh, so this is like kind of going beyond just the identifying the data, um, and you need to kind of um, it's, it's more about really like testing and checking to see you know like what what can be done. So this uh, motivated intruder test is a really good way to kind of run some scenarios around that and think about the audiences that you're sharing stuff with. And a lot of this as well is, is like a sliding scale, you know, it's like how, what's the kind of risk or the sensitivity of what you're talking about and how, what would be like the worst case scenario if that data got out and then you kind of make a decision about what the, um, you know, how much, how, how, what are the lengths that you need to go to and like to, in order to, to protect that. Um, it's, it's a lot, it's, it's to, to truly anonymize something is like is really really difficult um, and i think a lot of the times i see especially in sort of in enterprise is people use the word anonymization but it's not actually they're not actually anonymizing that, that data so it's kind of something to to look out for um yeah so let's get back to uh, back to mirror okay i'll just see if i can I if i can pop this link up again I think it's because I'm sharing my screen, I can't do it, but maybe I'll, um, I'll put it on later. So now that we've got the, the pipes are kind of in place and that's kind of well set up, we've got these data cards um, up here. So I'll kind of bring these down a little bit. So for a different, there's this, we've got a different colored card for each one. So there's personal identifiable data, um, depersonalized data and anonymized data. So we'll start off with going back to the device and what I've captured that data on. Um, as a recording, this is uh, I can hear the person's voice, and they might be they might be saying things at this point, or they might be telling me like stories or giving me information through that conversation, um, which is which is personally identifiable to them. So um, it's actually really difficult to anonymize voice without changing the, the you know altering the voice in some way. So this audio data in this sense is actually you know, will always kind of be uh, personally identifiable to to some to some extent. Um, so at this point it's on my Android and we've got these ditto cards up here because we did when I first started doing this workshop it was like people were just writing the same thing out over and over and over again um, and it was getting a bit onerous so we just have this ditto so for each point along the journey if it's still the same and um, you can just kind of copy and paste one of these cards up uh, and then it refers back to the last one and then if at any point this changes so here it's still the same and um, here it's still the same in fact, actually, sorry, let's put that in. So it's a recording from the interview and the type is audio. Um, so at this point, uh, I've got it on my laptop. And then uh, in the in this software or app, I start to remove identifiers. Um, 
in the clip. So let's say it's actually still going to be personal identifiable information. So maybe this is a bad example to kind of run through because you have the voice on there still. But just for the sake of demonstration, let's say that um, at this point I might do something to depersonalize it. So maybe I would edit the person's voice out or I would edit the um, uh, you know, anything that they were telling me, like if they told me about a place or somewhere like that. Um, so that kind of like de-risks that, that data. And then same again, I can kind of like pull that through. So there's still this kind of risk. So at this point here, I've kind of lost control potentially of, the, of that data. Um, and it's still potential that that person can be identified. So that starts to introduce like a bit of risk into this, this process. Um, maybe from that interview, I may, let's say, let's just run through another one. Um, maybe I took some photographs as well to kind of tell a story about what had happened uh, and give some sort of, make the insights a bit more human. Um, so at this point, this could be uh, photographs. Um, images. So let's say photographs of um, maps or something, I don't know, um, or just artifacts. So this is kind of going to be the same again. When I get this onto uh, onto here, it would be it would be Photoshop I would use for this, and then I could essentially completely strip out identifiers from that. So that if it was a photograph, I might like blur their faces um, and make sure there was nothing in there that could like tie them back to. Uh, to other places. So you can start to think about some of this stuff proactively as well. Like you, you can spend a lot of time in, in this process in terms of like um, depersonalizing or um, anonymizing your data. But if you quite, if you kind of know about it ahead of time, when you, when you go to do that research, you can uh, be, a, be a bit cleverer with how you, um, or be creative even with like how you capture data in the first place so that you can still use it to tell the story that you want to tell, um, but without having to necessarily capture as much uh, personal identifiable information. So that kind of like carries, carries through. And then at this point, that's kind of a bit, a bit more comfortable about that. Does, that. does that make sense? Yeah, cool. How do people feel about, uh, are we looking for time? Yeah, how do people feel about kind of giving that a go for like maybe 10, 15 minutes and then just seeing how we get on? Cool. If you get stuck or have any questions or anything, just kind of give us a give us a shout. Does that make sense? Do you have any questions? Sorry, it felt like a bit rushed. <laughs> Sorry, Phil. Can you repeat that? I was a bit de delayed in recording. Oh, okay, sorry. Um, where did uh, where, when did when did I start? <laughs> um, the resources. Oh yeah. So um, if you wanted to, uh, yeah, I, I kind of appreciate this is quite a quick um, a quick run through of, of 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 how it works and what it is. Um, if you wanted to just sort of take this away and do it under your own steam, I've just shared a link to um, to where you can download the. The, the workshop from so it's like the workshop and it's a PDF with all of the assets and stuff in it but I'll, I'll also leave the mirror board open and um, for people to uh, if they wanted to use it afterwards and um, if you want I think you, you might be able to export your boards from there but if not um, let me know and uh, in fact I'll put my email address in here as well and if you wanted to get in touch for, with for anything then I will be happy to help you out does anyone have any any questions Uh, are you allowed to say what kind of research um, this process has been used for or by without naming people maybe? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so we've, we've used this with, um, uh, I work is in the Federation in Manchester, which is like a, um, so it's like an incubator for, for, for kind of like social good, uh, social impact organizations. And uh, we've done it with a few organizations in there in terms of like helping them to um, just kind of work through their process to get them to think about, stop and think about like how data is moving through that and then what's happening to that and how they're deleting it and stuff. And then we've helped them to 
um, create these kind of processes uh, and like things like data impact assessments and stuff like that off the back of uh, off the back of this. Um, and yeah, and we've done it with a few of our customers as well, um, and so who are like kind of larger organisations. But the biggest one's probably the co-op and um, the co-op digital team. Okay, cool, nice. I'd be I'd be really interested to hear how this kind of goes down in uh, in academia, um, because it's it's I'm kind of conscious it's very much for uh, for research teams working in a, in a kind of commercial environment and whether and that, how like what kind of methods and techniques people use and like how applicable uh, this might be or how this might be adapted uh, to kind of give you know either give people like an introduction to that or um, introduction to how they manage their data in research and like and things like consent and stuff and whether that would actually be, be useful at all. So, 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 so Phil I'm, I mean I'm working uh, at one of the things I'm doing at the University of Manchester is around secure environments for research data. So um, one of the challenges is how we get researchers to think about whether what they're doing is research or not. And at the moment, we present them with a set of mm, non-intuitive forms, shall I say politely, um, to, to complete. Um, and, and I think a process like this actually might be quite useful to kind of to discuss with our, with our research governance people. So. Um, maybe uh, after the meeting, I'll, I'll be in touch and we can perhaps uh, set up a meeting at some point. Yeah, that would be great. I'd be really interested in that. I feel like that's kind of it. Is that it's quite um, it's quite it's quite a big barrier to entry for a lot of people coming into this um, and to, to get into. And it's really what I'm uh, really interested in doing with consent kit and with ethics kit is like really trying to lower that barrier and just kind of making it easier for people to do the right thing. But also, it feels like kind of having a bottom up approach to that is quite. It makes it a bit more human, if that makes sense. But yeah, I'd be, interested, I'd be really interested to see how that uh, how that works. I'd, I'd like to follow up with you on that. I'd, I'd agree with Gary. I think the same conversations are going on where where we are about trying to lower the bar so that it's easy for people to do the right thing and think about the process. But there's there's a huge benefit for reproducibility and just people caring about the quality of their research planning. Full stop by making these sorts of tools, you know, available at the beginning of their planning rather than later. On. Cool. Yep. It would be great. It would be um, it'd be great to follow up with you, Lawrence, afterwards as well, if that's possible, and kind of hear about what you're doing at Oxford. So.